Hello? Okay, so it's two o'clock. Uh, welcome to the HPC technology or applications uh, section today. And um, our, we have uh, two very good speakers lined up for this afternoon session. Our first is uh, Dr. Bubakar Ba. Uh, he is the head of the data science research group at the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences or AIM South Africa. He also has an affiliation with the Division of Applied Mathematics at Stellenbosch University. Today, uh, he will be talking to us about the large scale computations in data science. So over to you, Dr. Ba. Unmute, sorry. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, do I need to share my show my video or not? Uh, you can if you want. Okay, yeah. good. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you for inviting me for this session, uh, and I'm glad to be here. And I think uh, CSPC has been super beneficial to my group, and it's really uh, I think uh, beneficial for me to be here and and share those. Uh, uh, ideas with you people on some of the work we have done using the CHPC. Um, so we are the AIMS data science, AIMS South Africa data science group. Uh, we are a team of 10 researchers, three PhDs, three MSCs, and three postdocs. And we work on different areas of, of data science, uh, ranging from theory to algorithms and computations and applications, okay? and. HPC resources, of course, are mostly needed for our algorithm testing and computations, and also for applications. Um, the, the, the deep learning theory part, though we do some simulations, but usually you can run those on a computer, on a laptop, in a personal laptop. Uh, so CHPC has been the main source of high performance computing for us. As you know, most of these models we are running are deep uh, learning models and they are very huge and needs a lot of computing, especially GPU computation. I remember I was bordering uh, the uh, team, the technical team at CHPC for installation of a lot of stuff because, uh, yeah, I think not many people are using those things that uh, my group uh, wanted to use at that time. Yeah, just to mention that we also use other resource high performance computing resources or cloud computing resources like uh, the Stellenbosch in cluster in, in the cluster in Stellenbosch because for some reason uh, I am I am somehow affiliated with Stellenbosch but also AIMS has a unique relationship with Stellenbosch so we are allowed to use uh, uh, their computing resources but then you have this uh, available cloud computing resources like Google uh, Collaboratory Amazon Web Services, where we have also, which we have also used. Okay, so I just give an example of some of the theoretical work that we do. This is a recent paper we submitted at the Journal of Inference and uh, Information and Inference, and we were trying to understand uh, deep neural networks and how they relate to Romanian gradient gradient flows and convergence to global minimizers. This is purely a theoretical uh, endeavor. We were looking at uh, uh, the issue of convergence of uh, the most popular algorithm used currently in, in, in neural networks, which is the gradient descent or the stochastic gradient descent to be more specific. And it turned out you can reformulate, if you look at uh, the continuous version of this, this would be like a gradient flow, okay? And then you would then uh, try to understand this, how does it convert to local minima or still saddle points or global minima and things like this. So this was the whole point. We did some simulations, but mostly it was on my computer. Okay, another example was where we tried to reformulate uh, the neural network with a uh, uh, design uh, activation function where you just have zero or one. You can think of this as an integer programming problem 
And we thought we probably if we do it that way, we may want to understand some of the properties of the solutions that we get. Okay, and again, the simulations were mostly on a personal computer. Okay, so those are two examples on some theory problems we worked okay. on. Well, can I just pause you for a second there? Yeah. I think you're not sharing your screen at the moment. Oh, I see. Oh, thank you for reminding me I was here. There we go, that's better, thank you. Okay, so this is what I went through quickly and that was the paper I was referring to on the learning of deep linear networks. And that was the last one I just talked about. I was gonna move, uh, so in terms of uh, computations, one project that we worked on is what is referred to as the error correction neural network. And so this was joint work with uh, my two collaborators, Ronnie Becker, who was uh, at AIMS uh, South Africa here, but with also Hans uh, Georg Zimmermann, who is uh, 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 at, at the Fraunhofer Society in Germany. And then this was the main project of my master's student, Kla uh, Mubu. And then uh, we had an intern, Christian and Emmanuel, who also worked on this, mostly in the coding part when we were implementing this algorithm and the later and, and testing. So here yeah, they, they also use a lot of uh, hours at CHPC, at the CHPC. And the idea is you want to say, okay, this is a kind of recording neural network that is suitable for economic forecasting. So you want sometimes in, in economic data, you have some missing data. Okay, some missing information, or you're trying to model the, 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 the dependencies, the underlying data, you don't know exactly what, which is dependent on which. So what you want to do is you want to say, okay, I'm going to take to a recurrent relation where I loop in any error I make during the prediction. Okay, so that's that's it. so you can think of that as a dynamical system where you're trying to predict. You put in x and predict y, but also you loop in some stuff. That's typically how a, a recurrent neural network works. So you keep the states of a state equation here, which is defined in this such the state at time t, some function of some matrix times your previous state plus a matrix times whatever input you're putting in, okay? So sometimes this is referred to as an external force. So this is the standard for vanilla RNN. And the, the ECNN was a modification of this where you just don't only loop in the state, but you loop in some of the error you make in the previous step, okay? Z, uh, T is the difference between your prediction and the actual data that you have. And you input that in your previous step into your state equation, okay? And it turned out that this works well. So just quickly to wrap, I don't know if people are familiar with recurrent neural networks, I thought I should just show what's happening. I just saw the case where this is a, uh, it's a succinct representation in that case. So you might wanna say, let's unfold it and see what's going on. Okay, you see the time steps going backwards uh, and you would be entering this data, the external forces, they would be multiplied by a matrix B the previous state is multiplied by another matrix A and the output will multiply by C, which is Y. And you compare your, your, this output, which is your prediction to your to the actual data, you do that through a loss function LT. And then you roll this over time. And then you try to learn this A, B and C matrices. These are your parameters that you learn for, for the neural network. But the recurrent neural networks not only loop in the, 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 the states, but it loops in the error you make. So you say, and in this state, I make an error, uh, which is a difference between my data and my prediction, and I will call that ZT. So the extra uh, terms, uh, uh, so it's, it's gonna be similar structure, but then you wanna have this extra red connections, okay? That's the ECNN. And it turned out that it's, uh, it's more robust uh, to the kind of problems we look at, it performed better, and I also, so first of all, what was the goal? So this was uh, uh, introduced by researchers at Siemens when uh, uh, Zimmerman was at Siemens. And the, the idea was to be able to implement it because the, 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 uh, the, the code isn't available for people to use. So we wanted to implement it and make it open source for people to use. So first uh, you should be able to implement the, the Gradient descent upgrade, which is the, which is which gives you the back propagation, which is just uh, gradient descent plus the chain rule. Okay, so just to remind you, what you do in the gradient descent, you the, the, the value of 
the new weight, new value of your weights will be the value of the previous weights in the previous iterate minus some learning rate eta times the gradient evaluate at your previous uh, weight. Okay. So this is how you update this. So we needed to be able to compute these gradients of this L. I so you the L, the L is the, the loss function. Okay. So the, the whole point was project was trying to compute this and then implement it and implement the code. Okay. So I'll, 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 I'll throw under the rock the, 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 the computation, the, like the derivation. So just so some of the simulation. So we met after implementing and, and, and setting up uh, everything, we made an experiment to compare the, to see the performance of this. So we looked at three, uh, five different stock indices. Um, the Hang Seng index, the Nikkei and the Dai, Dai Jones and the S&P 500 indices. So we looked at uh, over 10 years of data for these uh, indices. These are, rocker, these are stock indices. And we wanted to be able to do prediction. So we would do a one step ahead prediction. And we compared uh, the ECNN and the uh, RNN, okay? So, of course, each, each of, if you're aware of a bit, you know a bit about stocks is you have four different prices to look for. So when the price opens, there's an opening price, there's a closing price, there's the low price and the highest price, and there's a volume, okay? So we were using those as input, but we were just predicting the closing price, okay? And then where there are other additional features that you may want to add to increase the, the expressivity of your, 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 your predictor, uh, your, your, your model, uh, these are technical indicators that have been developed over the years about stock, uh, stock trade, okay? And then we compared it to the state of the art models, including some hybrid models that would do a pre-processing model with wavelets or something like that on the data and then apply a, 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 an LSTM, for instance. So, I don't know if people are, are, are familiar, but then the recurrent neural networks that exist there, I just showed the simple one, the simple RNN, but there's a, a more sophisticated one called the LSTM. So we compared our ECNN both to LSTM and the standard uh, uh, RNN. And we, were, we use this, uh, there are also some uh, matrices that exist, that's accuracy criteria that exist that people use. TLU is one of them that is marked as R. I'm also skipping the definition of these. But then, okay, also training people, you want to know how much you split your data, we split into 8 to 10 for validation and 10 for testing. And this is just a pictorial representation to show uh, how well our, our, our algorithm was doing compared to others. So the RS, RNN, LSTM, ECN, and the real one. So you can see we are always closer to the blue line. Okay, we are the red one, blue line, compared to the others. Okay. And so, yeah, so the ECNN was a goal, implementing on the ECNN was a goal to create this Python code and make it open source and it could be implemented in other languages. And it wouldn't be possible without CHPC running all the simulations on CHPC taking days and hours and hours to run. Okay. And we saw that it's doing well, it's doing, doing better than the RNN and LSTM, especially if you're looking at this kind of economic variables like stock prices and commodity prices, for instance. We are predicting those and yeah so the goal for, for economic prices i mentioned it also is because sometimes you don't know all the driving external variables and we are looping in in this error this 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 makes it uh, more or this makes it perform better in forecasting than the others okay and it can perform high nonlinear uh, relationship from real world noisy data without needing any smoothing so we try to apply uh, exponential smoothing to compare it with uh, we applied for exponential smoothing to ECNN and LSTM and the RNN and we saw that the exponential smoothing is not get, is, is not getting better than just using the standard ECNN so it doesn't need any exponential smoothing okay all right so the second example I wanted to give is a project I worked on with my postdoc Shankar we had uh, tons of video and we wanted to be able to uh, accident videos, video about uh, traffic accidents. The idea was now you have this video that are labeled that the video at some point has an accident or has no accident, okay? So you have the input data video, but then you have a label that says there was an accident or no accident, okay? So the idea is you train a neural network on this and it will predict, uh, uh, when you give it a video, it can tell you whether that video it has an accident in it or not, okay? That was the goal. 
So yeah, it's a, the algorithm is a basic one. You, what you do is you split uh, traffic video, uh, what we did into four seconds, we did it into four seconds, into individual frames, okay? Each, each video has 10 frames. Then we use the, EC, the CNN, which is a conventional neural network to detect and localize humans, bicycles, motorbikes, cars, uh, all these objects of interest that we want. So the CNN will detect and localize the object like this. There you can, are you seeing my course, all right? So this here, the CNN would be used to do this, but then you wanna do the, ex, uh, you wanna, uh, you use the, uh, how to call it, the RNN to model this, uh, temporal dependencies, okay, in the frames, okay? So RNN predicts probability of accident of each frame, and for each video, you, you, set, you set a threshold and say, if uh, the accident probability is more than that threshold, then it, it would make an alert that, okay, an accident is gonna happen somewhere. But as you're going, as, you, as you're going, passing through these uh, frames, it's, it's measuring this probability and because you train it on, on, on video that has accident and don't, that don't, don't have accident. So at some point it will learn some unique features about videos that have accident and it can, it can it will trigger an alarm. Of course, it's not 100%. As you can see our results, we got like 68% accuracy, meaning for every 100 traffic videos with the RNN sounds and alarm, 60 uh, are really indeed end up being accidents, but 32 were just uh, false uh, false negatives, okay? Which, well, which is uh, not bad as long as you are getting the accidents right, okay? So that was that was the project. We, we tried it on, that was a publicly available data set and it was getting, giving us this, this uh, results, but uh, we, we, we are trying to work with uh, local traffic departments here to see if we can have other data that we can we can run it on, and so we welcome anybody who have any idea or who, who can connect us to people who have data like this, and we can run it on that. Okay. Then the ta the last example I want to give on the application side is making classification decision on tabular data using convolutional neural network. So typically, when you have table tab tabular data, you would use standard. Uh, uh, or how to call it, artificial neural network, ANN, standard ANN, or you would use others like uh, other classical machine learning algorithm like uh, three-based methods or linear regression or something like that, okay? But we thought we had this idea and said, probably maybe if we can convert this data to a picture, because we know this nice uh, results about its convolutional neural networks, actually these are the most powerful uh, tools in, in deep learning, in, 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 in this whole machine learning hype, this convolutional neural network, mostly. Now recorded neural networks are also doing very well, but the combination with CNNs also can, can do some, some nice things. But CNNs are very powerful, and we thought we could use them for tabular data. So that was the goal, goal of this project. So you're given a tabular data like this one, instead of applying a standard uh, SVM or any other algorithm, can I use uh, uh, force, take this and convert this to a color code like uh, this, okay? Make this uh, squares or make a dial, okay, out of it. We tried dials, we tried uh, uh, squares, we tried them having all of them in a line, but just trying to make a color coding from zero to whatever uh, the value, largest value you have. So you represent each row with one of these or a dial or, or, or uh, just a line uh, of, of, of bars like this one, horizontal. And then we train a convolutional neural network to do the prediction. We already have the levels, right? And do a prediction. It turned out, well, this is not getting us much like we expected because I, thought we, I think this should be expected, right? You don't get much information converting these numbers into a picture. This picture is not rich enough compared to a natural picture, okay? So it didn't, it didn't do well as we expected, but sometimes it's, uh, it's surprisingly very close to what you would have with uh, other, uh, other standard uh, uh, machine learning algorithms. So uh, you can see on here, we made a comparison in the, with, with other algorithms. So the CNN one is this guy here. Uh, so the training accuracy was 100%. 
the test accuracy was 0 0.988, okay? And this one we are getting 0 0.99, 0 0.99. We did better than MLP, the standard uh, uh, ANN. And this was doing better than us. No, we did, did better than SPM, as we see in this case, which was interesting. So in this particular data set, but most of the data set, this was not the case. And why why this data set? What you factor? I didn't mention what data set. This is a breast, breast cancer data set, okay, where we uh, cut, say, it's a... Uh, uh, how to call it, benign or malignant, okay? We decide whether it's, it's the cancer, it's, it's benign or malignant, okay? And we're using these features like the radius, the texture, the perimeter, the area, and different other stuff that are measured about, about the, the picture, the, the image of, of the cancer. Uh, so, yeah, this is, this is what, this is the best we could get, but most of the time it was doing far less than the others, and you wouldn't, uh, like invest a lot of time trying to generate these dials and at the end of the day you're not doing much better and I, I, we definitely think it's just because they, uh, you're not getting any extra information by creating these uh, images uh, one thing we have we conjectured is that if you have very huge dimensional data where for instance genomic information about something maybe that one uh, again it might be easier to, 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 to just represent it as an image but we did one where more or less look like a noise if you look at the pictures it's like noise so we didn't gain much again in that one so but yeah so but it was nice trying this and saying that okay one could use cnns to do this but i don't think it's worth the extra uh, stress to do good through that yeah this were three examples that were all dependent or used hpc hpc very well we appreciate the support we have been like bordering this team there with different kind of packages that we need for this thing to run but yeah this is the interesting research going on that is supported through the, your, your pc services and uh, i thank you for inviting me here i think i already exhaust my time uh, if you have any questions you're welcome to ask thank you hey thank you dr bar um Okay, guys, there is still some time before we move on to the next presentation. So the floor is open for questions. I'm going to have a look here. The question is from Quinn Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Dr. Barr. Very impressive work. I'm surprised that you still have time to talk to us if you have figured out how to predict the stock market. Because <laughs> they are adaptive self-correcting methods. I would imagine that ECNNs can be used for real-time applications like engineering process control. Do you have any comments on that? Yes. Um, no, well, uh, I don't know. This was, uh, so I should have said, so this is like a one step ahead prediction and it needs a lot of training for now. So this was just a first step. I don't think right now I can just take this and run away to the stock market and say, Come, I'm gonna make you money. So no, I don't think it will work that way. But hopefully, it could be developed. And what I have seen Siemens use use this for is mostly about commodity predictions. You know, commodity prices. These are long, more more longer term. You know, people want to invest in commodities, for instance, like copper or aluminium. Big big, big businesses want to buy this. They use this to project prices in the next five or ten years. So we hope this is improved uh, so that it could be used for that. But uh, um, this high frequency trading in stock markets right now, I don't think this would stand a chance. The amount of time you need to train, it might be a little bit long. Uh, so yes, that's, that's the caveat about, about it. But again, yes, so this definitely could be used in, in, in engineering setups where, for instance, uh, you are modeling what you said. Yes, if you have time series data, you know, you can definitely use something like this. Yeah. Okay, I'm waiting to see if there are any other questions because we still have like five minutes before the next okay. session. Well, you know, um, I cut all my slides because I thought it was just 20 minutes. I cannot go beyond 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, there's, there's one from my side. I would like to know, mm. with the model that you run, mm. is the 12-hour the wall time sufficient on Lingao for the GPUs, for instance? No, it's not. This is uh, the complaint about this. But what we do, what, what, what we try to, I advise them is um, save your model and rerun. So that's what they do. They try, they, do. they would save whatever, wherever they stop and then restart after the 12, 12 hour world time. 
Okay, so the, major, the, the, the majority are, are running in, within 12 hours, but there are some that go beyond 12. Okay, but they do have restartability, which is good. Yes, sure, sure. So they would be saving at every day, they would fix, fix time to where they're saving the models as they are running, and they would just restart from where they start their last save. Okay. Um, guys, if there's any other questions, you're welcome to pop it in the Q&A box. I'm going to give it just like another minute okay. and then I'll let you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, it was a quick one. I, don't know. Yeah. I was talking too fast or something. Or people have understood everything I was saying. <laughs> Oh, uh, you also can raise your hand if you wish to ask a verbal question. I was just notified about that. Okay, I don't see anything. So thank you, Dr. Bar, for your talk. Um, it's a pleasure. All right, guys, so the next talk will start at uh, 2.30. So we have about four minutes. I'm going to start exactly at 2.30 in case there's others from the other sessions that wish to join. Okay. So, so we, we can, we can like come back. Okay. okay. Yeah. You can, right. you can leave or you can just be there and just put your camera up. It's up to you. Okay. All right. Thank you. And Okay, according to my watch, it's exactly half past two. So we're going to start with the next session. Uh, those of you that might have just joined us now for the second talk, uh, during the course of the talk, you guys are welcome to put in your questions in the Q&A section that's at the bottom of your screen. That's way we also ensure that your questions get answered should there not be enough time towards the end. And you are, of course, also welcome to just ask at the end of the talk. It's up to you. Um, so our next speaker is Professor John Mack. Professor Mack is from Rhodes University at the Department of Chemistry, and his research revolves around porphyrin and patellocyanine with strong fo focus on the use of MCD spectroscopy and TDDFT calculations to analyze the electronic structures and optical properties of novel porphyrinoids. So today you'll be speaking to us about the rational design of tin 4 porphyrins for photodynamic therapy. So over to you, Prof. Mack. I think we're using the recording, are we not? Yes, uh, I believe they're going to replay your recording. That's correct. Yes.
Okay, the title of my presentation is 10 for Preference for Photodynamic Therapy, Progress to Date and Future Perspectives. This work has been carried out at Rhodes University in close collaboration with Professor Callum Neerfarm and also in future with collaborators in Brazil, Maurizio Batista, University of Sao Paulo, and Diego Tasso at the Federal University of North Carolina. And given this is mainly a computer modeling crowd, I should probably start off by explaining what PDT is. It's a form of cancer therapy which uses a photosensitizer dye in light to generate reactive oxygen species, which can bring about the death of cancer cells and the elimination of tumors. So the research focuses on finding suitable molecular dyes produced as the photosensitizer in this process. Basically, this is the Jablonski diagram explaining what's going on. We photo excite the photosensitizer dye, it winds up in the S1 state, into system crossing to lowest energy triplet state. And from there, there's two types of mechanisms to form reactive oxygen species. The main focus of our research tends to be the type 2 mechanism, which is the formation of singlet oxygen. But there's also a type 1 mechanism which results in transfer of electrons to form radicals. And these reactive oxygen species, as previously mentioned, can destroy the cancer tumor cells and result in destruction of cancer tumors. Up until recently, uh, a series of porphyrin dyes have been approved for use in PDT in cancer treatment. The initial one to be approved back in the 1970s was Photofrin, and more recently there's been Foscan and Vertiporphyrin as well. So the focus of the research primarily is to try to find more suitable dyes that can be used to replace the ones that are already in use so that a wider range of tumors can be dealt with and more people can successfully undergo PDT for cancer tumors. The big issue with porphyrins is to be that in order for PDT to work, we need to be able to get light into human tissue. And that tends to work best between about 650 and 1000 nanometers. And that's because there's a window between the wavelength range where hemoglobin absorbs on the one hand and water absorbs on the other hand. So between about 650 and 850 nanometers is the ideal range to have the absorption band for the photosensitizer dye, which generates the oxygen radical species. And the big problem with porphyrin is that it really doesn't absorb very strongly in that spectral range. Easy to synthesize and uh, good from that standpoint, but it would be better if we could modify the porphyrin structure in order to be able to have greater absorption between 650 and 850 nanometers. So a few years ago, uh, I carried out a study in chemical reviews that looked at uh, the optical properties of expanded contracted and isomeric properties from the point of view of molecular modeling and understanding how the main spectral bands can be shifted to the red into the 650-850 nanometer region. And what structural modifications can be carried out with portion living to be able to come up with dyes that are more suitable for the PDT process. And over the next 15 minutes or so, I'll be describing recent progress that we have had in this area. Portion is a starting point, but we'll also be looking at chlorines, where there's peripheral reduced bond 
can all spin as a direct bond between two of the terrible rings that make up the quarks and ligands, and also n confused quarks. So one of the pearl nitrogens rotates out to the outside of the ring. And the changes in the absorption spectroscopy resulting from this form styles which are more suitable for use in PDT. And we're using computer modeling to help guide us to select the most suitable modified dyes that are worth synthesizing and studying from the point of view of cell studies to check how well they work as photosensitized dyes in the context of PDT. So a couple of years ago, our starting point was to look at 10 four quark dyes with final rings at the meso positions between the four pearls. The thought here is that having the two axial ligands helps to prevent aggregation, which is important from the point of view of the force of physics that's involved. And computer modeling had made us aware that there's a narrowing of the formal removal gap when you replace the final ring, which is the usual meso uh, substituent, with a final. And when we proceeded to prepare these compounds, we found that there was no issues with aggregation. We got very promising looking photochemical results with unusually high signal oxygen quantum yields for the tetrathionyl quadrant because of the heavy atom effect associated with the cells in the ring cell. And when we went ahead and did in vitro studies against MCS7 breast cancer cells, we got relatively low IC50 values, which suggested that we were moving in the right direction. These dyes were being, were entering into the cancer cells, and when light was shown on the appropriate wavelength, we were generating single oxygen, and that was leading to the destruction of the cancer cells. So this suggested that the tin for cyanide quarkins was a good starting point. And after that, the idea was to look at different quarkin analogs, such as corals, florins, and n confused quarkins, to see how we can shift the main absorption bands. Here we're getting to about 620, but we really want to be 650 to 850 for this application. So the next protocol was then for triaryl pearls. And here we have a direct pearl pearl bond. And what happens with these compounds is that you get the red shift of the absorption band out closer towards 650 nanometers. And again, we were finding that with the thionyl ring, there tends to be a narrowing of the homolimal gap, which helps result in the red shift of the absorption band out towards 650. 210 here is the tetraphenyl, the triphenyl, I should say, compound. And 110 here, which is more red shifty is the two thionyl substituted dye. And the big advantage with two thionyl is because it's a five-membered ring, it can rotate into the plane of the quark and ligand, and the interaction with the frontier pi orbitals for that reason can result in a narrowing of the whole normal gap. And again, we were not having a significant issue with aggregation because of the axial location above and below the ring, and we were obtaining promising looking single oxygen quantum yields. And basically, again, we were getting reasonable looking 
values for IC50 in the PDP process against MCF7 cells when using a Thor Lab 625 nanometer LED. And when we used the focal microscopy to have a look at what's happened to the cells, we could see that the cells were being destroyed in the process. And what we're finding is HIMPOA that are our quarkins have many advantages. So we moved forward from there. And where we went tonight was, oh, let's have a look at what we can do with quarkins again. And what happens if we add eight bromine atoms to the periphery of the quarkin ligand and how that affects the frontier pi orbitals and the UV does what sort of spectroscopy. And molecular modeling has told us that we should expect a significant red shift of the absorption band out beyond 650 nanometers, which indeed we obtained. And basically, this was because one of the MOs was relatively destabilized by the presence of the bromine atoms. And Again, when we did IC50 values against MCF7 breast cancer cells, we were obtaining reasonably promising results. And so, moving on from there, what else we've looked at recently is fluorines and N confused fluorines. So, for chlorines, this is actually the approach that nature uses for chlorophyll, is that the chlorophyll ligand, one of the chloral rings is reduced, and this results in a red shift of the main absorption band into the 650, 850 nanometer region. And we were looking for easily synthesized chlorines that could be prepared from the corresponding isometry chlorophyll compound by, redu by reduction of one of these bonds so that we have a dye that can be easily synthesized and easily scaled up in the context of an application. So again we're looking at the 2 thionyl because we found that we get a larger redshift for these and we've also looked here at what happens when we add a bromine atom to the ion by an ring. And in each case, we're getting 650 here is tetraphenyl. And when we move to thionyl, as molecular modeling had predicted, we found a larger redshift into the 650, 850 nanometer region. Again, we're finding reasonably high similar option quantum yields. And we were getting promising IC50 values with a 660 nanometer LED in vitro against MCS7 breast cancer cells. And we also did similar studies in another application called PACT. And here, similar sort of mechanism and going after hospital superbugs such as Staphylococcus aureus and E. coli with a similar sort of mechanism. And the packed big advantage here is that resistance doesn't build up. So we're also interested in looking at the antimicrobial action of these values as well. So getting back to more of the molecular modeling focus, in addition to our initial studies of free base elements, we've also recently submitted a manuscript development transactions, which we hope will be accepted soon on thin chlorine complexes, again with an actual ligand above and below the ring. And when we look at what happens with the homologable gap against the corresponding thin chlorine, we get a narrowing of the homologable gap, and that's what's resulting in the red shift of the spectral bands. And we also get a lifting of the molecular symmetry, the molecular symmetry. And for reasons I won't 
I don't have time to go into detail on, but actually helps to intensify the Q band, which referred to of the quadrant. Nature selected chlorophyll for that reason. You get a red shifted and intensified Q band at the maximum of solar flux. And for similar reasons, we want to be at a similar sort of wavelength for PDP. And we're looking to make a similar structural transformation on an easily synthesized chlorophyll dye through a reduction process to give us the chlorine. And we got a really low IC50 value with 660 nanometer LED light in this context, which is really quite exciting. 640 nanometers almost to where we want to be, which is 650 to 850 nanometers. So how do we really get to redshift the Q bands out to about 800 nanometers? And the answer for that turns out to be N could choose platforms where one of the pearl nitrogen atoms is flipped out to the ligand periphery. And here, because of the effect of the structural transformation on the frontier pi orbitals that are associated with the major spectral bands, you get a very large narrowing of the, the homo lobo gap in the context of the NQQ's coefferents. And this helps to shift the lowest energy absorption band out to around 800 nanometers in some contexts, which is really where we want to be with PDP because you get the deepest light pen penetration into human tissue at that sort of wavelength. And again, the synthesis is a little bit more complex than making the normal portion, but not drastically so. So we're really interested in finding easily synthesized analogs of the tinfoil portion, which was a starting point where we can shift the lowest absorption band by playing around with the energies of the frontier orbitals out as far as possible towards 800 nanometers. In this case, the lowest energy band in some solvents was 740 and other solvents was out even beyond 800. And again, with tin as a heavy central metal ion, we were able to get comparatively high standard oxygen points of yields in this context, 0.72. And when we carried out uh, in vitro studies against MCF7 breast cancer cells, we were able to get comparatively low IC50 values. And this definitely looks like a good starting point for moving forward. And with some further structural modifications, coming up with something which could be taken forward into clinical trials. So, what we found is the suitable possible starting points in terms of the molecule pin four and being confused. And the next step in the project, we'll be looking at ways to enhance aqueous solubility. One of my students, uh, Rhoda Soy, has been looking at uh, conjugation to nanoparticles of chlorophyll rings in future. We're just starting out with collaboration with Professor Rizzo Baptista, who's a biochemist in Brazil, and Professor Thiago Tasso. And we're going to be taking the dyes that we've identified through molecular modeling and really push it forward harder from a biochemistry sort of standpoint to get to the point we need to be where we have dyes that could realistically be taken forward into clinical trials for use of PDP. So, another part of conjugation will be one of the next right steps. We've been carrying out research with another part of conjugates of several devices that I've described so far. And one of my other students has been looking not only at thionyl rings, but also at methyl thiol substituted phenyl rings, which make it easier to conjugate to 
full nano particles. The advantages of full nano particles in this context is that they're water soluble and can be used as a transport agent to get the photosensitized dyes into the tumor cells and they selectively accumulate into cancer cells. So that's another big advantage of nanoparticle conjugation. So to summarize, because I have been up to 20 minutes, the use of CHPC resources helped to guide the rational design of a series of different types of tinfoil tetraaromorphin and the corol, corn, and the APP porphyrin analogues by helping us to select the dyes that were most suitable for further study and synthesis so that we knew ahead of time what the properties were likely to be rather than doing that by serendipity. And that helped us to really hone in on the dyes that would give us the properties that we wanted. So the guiding principle of this research is to identify porphyrin analogues with fast cell synthesis that can be readily scaled up, which have promising properties in vitro against cancer risk of breast cancer cells. And from here, the point, the next step will be taking the scaffolds that we've identified as being promising and taking it a little further to enhance the solubility and lipophilicity properties like cycle there, and also investigating nanoparticle conjugation and incorporation of cancer targeting functionality. So we can get them to be suitable properties for aqueous solubility and cellular uptake, and hopefully get the IC50 values down as low as possible. And I should finish off with some acknowledgements. It was remiss of me not to mention an Indian postdoc called Guaji Babu, who has carried out a lot of the synthesis and a lot of the cell studies that I have talked about throughout. His picture was in the circle of the slides. I'd also like to thank Professor Bidalamia from Roach University for providing the opportunity to use this approach to carry to de develop novel porphyrin ligands for nanotechnology applications. And thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Mack, for the talk. Um, it's from Quinn Reynolds. Thank you, Prof. Mack. Great presentation and interesting work. It is very computationally expensive to perform the orbital energy and absorbance curve calculations for each molecular variant, or is it very ex expensive? It actually really isn't. Like uh, I, I should have mentioned at some point during the presentation that this is carried out using Gaussian. And most of the calculations on the Lingo cluster were talking three or four hours maybe for geometry optimization, and then maybe half an hour for EDFD. So really not particularly computationally expensive. Okay, um, while I'm waiting on other questions, there's one from me. So which version of like Gaussian are you using? Because I'm assuming you're using Gaussian for these simulations. Uh, just out of course the habit, I've been using Gaussian 9. I don't think for this type of calculation, 9 to 16 makes any huge difference. But at, at some point, certainly we'll be moving on to Gaussian 16 and seeing what new possibilities are with the, the latest version of Gaussian. Yes, because that would have been my suggestion, because there has been some advancement in the optimization with Gaussian 16. So it's supposed to be a bit faster. And there's a few GPU components, which they are working on at the moment. Certainly, we'll be doing that in the not too future. OK, um, just waiting to see if there are any other comments. Guys, you can also raise your hands, remember, if you want to ask a question in person. Okay, if there are no more questions, then I'm going to thank both our speakers. Thank both of you, thanks both you guys for the presentations.
And thank you everyone for attending. Um, I think this will just basically bring the session to a close. The next one will begin at quarter past three. All right, thank you. Thanks and, and bye. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us back to the HPC applications uh, for this afternoon. My name is Benjamin Bosch and I'll be your chair for today. Uh, let me introduce our first uh, speaker, um, Mr. Moloto. Um, he currently works in the Faculty of Natural Science at Northwest University in South Africa and does research in cosmic ray modulation. And the current project is long-term cosmic ray uh, modulation. He will, he will be presenting today on large scale HPC computation success in modulating first principle cosmic ray modulation with extreme computations depends on CHPC resources and have resulted in the development of the most accurate models to date. Mr. Moloto, over to you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, let me see if I can get my, thank you for the introduction. Let me see if I can get my screen shared and we can get going. Uh, okay, so, um, my presentation today is going to be titled uh, An Ab Initial High Performance Computing uh, Approach to Time Dependent Cosmic Ray Modulation. And uh, as already mentioned, uh, this work uh, was done uh, for mostly my PhD, um, which actually coincidentally will be conferred tomorrow. And uh, it was done uh, in collaboration with uh, Professor Eugene Engelbrecht and uh, now retired uh, Professor Adri Bega. So uh, to give a, a, an outline of my talk, I'll quickly give uh, just a, an outline of uh, what uh, the Northwest University is, uh, just basically to make sure everybody's well informed. Then I'll give a problem statement to what we are trying to solve. Um, and then I'll give a, a small introduction to our modulation model. And then I will give uh, some sample solutions. So uh, the Northwest University officially came into being in January uh, 2004 uh, as part of the government's uh, transformation of the higher education sector. Uh, and it basically was the merger of three previously independent institutions, uh, the former Northwest University in Mafikeng, um, the Pochistrum University for Christian Higher Education, and the Van der Weyl Park campus of the Vista University. Um, at the Northwest University, I fall under the Center for Space Research Group. And uh, this is one of uh, five uh, research groups of excellence at the university. And uh, the center focuses on observational theoretical uh, research uh, in astrophysics, astronomy, and space physics with uh, some subsections of, uh, that are dedicated to the development of uh, innovative technologies. Uh, the group has existed in various forms over the past 50 years and uh, currently uh, offers a student training in uh, multi-wave length astronomy, star formation, um, astrophysics and space physics, which is going to be the area that I'm uh, actually talking about today. So if we look into space physics, uh, you have to think that uh, if you go into space, one of the things that you have to realize is that uh, space is full of uh, radiation, uh, both ionizing and non-ionizing uh, radiation. So if you talk about uh, um, this radiation, the ionizing radiations, um, the main groups that uh, it originates from uh, the particles that are trapped in the Van Allen belt um, as you exit uh, the, the, the atmosphere. Uh, it's uh, solar flare particles. Uh, these are now the particles that are coming from uh, explosions or any type of activity on the sun as it uh, throws out material into, into space. And then we have uh, as well uh, galactic cosmic rays. Now these are the particles that I'm going to be focusing on today, 
but I will not actually be talking about their origins. I will only be talking about uh, their transportation and, and, and acceleration. Uh, but just to give you a, a quick indication, they are thought to be generated when uh, in supernovae. So these are generated in uh, very massive explosions and therefore have uh, quite um, a lot of energy associated with them. Okay, so if you go into space, the, the radiation that we are talking about, the levels are actually quite low. Uh, it is not such a, a high amount of radiation uh, and it consists about 85% hydrogen and 14% helium. But the problem with this radiation is that uh, the dosages are actually, and the effects that you feel from them are actually cumulative. So the longer you're exposed to them, uh, the more damage uh, it is done to uh, a human being or uh, whatever equipment that you send out into space. Okay, and uh, there are three main factors that sort of determine uh, the amount of radiation that an astronaut or an equipment in space uh, will uh, succumb to. And uh, this uh, is down to an individual susceptibility to to the radiation. So each person and uh, each material sort of has its own properties and uh, different people will start showing effects and radiation sicknesses at different levels. Um, this is still actually quite a very uh, highly ongoing uh, research area. And I'm sure it's, it's going to become even more important in the next few years as we plan to colonize the Mars and to have bases on the moon and more and more people want to go do uh, space tourism. So this will definitely be a, a very active area in the near future. Um, the altitude above the earth also plays a, quite a role as I've already alluded to. As you cross the Van Halen belts, you do uh, get a rush of all the particles that are trapped in the magnetic fields there and any equipment or any spacecraft that needs to go into space has to cross this belt. So at some point you have to make sure that you protect all your equipment and all your crew members uh, sufficiently from uh, this radiation. And of course, as I've already alluded to, the, the sun often has these explosions and where it uh, throws material into uh, space. And um, these have been found to have an 11 year cycle um, where you go through uh, a dramatic period where there is quite a lot of these uh, explosions uh, called solar flares and there's quite a lot of material that is being uh, thrown into space uh, which can then affect uh, the amount of radiation and during this time as well the sun produces a, a lot of uh, magnetic field a very strong magnetic field and this magnetic field uh, can then uh, prohibit or stop the the flow of uh, cosmic ray, uh, galactic cosmic rays, which I will be uh, talking about in a little while. So, and then there's are periods where the sun is uh, very quiet and there is not so much activity and the magnetic field is lower. And uh, as well, the cosmic rays, the galactic cosmic rays that we see um, are also much higher because they do not have the, the sun's magnetic field uh, stopping them from coming in. Okay, so galactic cosmic rays, uh, as I've already mentioned, have the highest energies and pose the most uh, significant uh, risk to any human endeavors in space. And uh, these, uh, especially for any long-term missions that you want to do, if you're considering uh, any travel period to Mars or any far, further away planet, will take you up to six months or so, you really need to make sure that you take these into uh, consideration uh, very well. Okay, so just to quickly summarize all the effects that uh, cosmic rays can have. Uh, if you think of uh, the ones that I was talking about as the sun explodes and uh, ejects a lot of material into space, this material can then get trapped in the uh, Van Halen belts and it can then create uh, currents that end up affecting the, the power grid. Uh, some of these have, uh, uh, were experienced in Canada uh, back in the 90s where there was a big uh, uh, blackout. Uh, and the problem with, with, the, with, especially when it affects the power grids is that 
most of the power station or substations that fail are custom built for a particular area. So it's not something that you can uh, hot swap out once it fails. So you have to, you have to know how, when and how these uh, will most probably uh, be affecting you such that you can take precautionary matters. Uh, they can also affect uh, radio communications and satellite communications. Uh, and in this day and age where we are all so highly reliant on uh, these uh, type of communications, uh, it can become uh, very disastrous if, if one were to lose uh, such communications. The GPS system is also, uh, can also be heavily affected by uh, cosmic rays. And especially now when we are starting to talk about the advent of the fourth industrial revolution, where you are going to have more and more uh, ITO type things. And um, most probably all of them will be quite dependent on the GPS system. If it were to fail, then you will end up with the, the majority of the uh, first world uh, in darkness, uh, not being able to, to, to operate at all. Then of course, there is the, the aviation and human exploration that I've already alluded to. And uh, for people that are taking just a couple of flights a year, um, this does not really pose any uh, risks. Uh, the risks are more to uh, flight crews um, that take quite a number of flights and especially those that fly over the poles. Um, this can add to that cumulative exposure that I was talking about. And there is currently uh, new laws um, that have been uh, uh, proposed or actually that are starting to be implemented in South Africa. And these laws have been around in Europe for a while now to try and limit the number uh, of flights uh, that uh, pilots and their crew uh, take that expose them to, to such radiation. So basically uh, starting somewhere next year, uh, all flights will have to carry uh, some sort of uh, dosimeter to just make sure that uh, everybody is, is, is still uh, within the minimal uh, safety dosages of uh, radiation. Okay, so uh, what we did was uh, to study these is we ended up uh, writing a custom written uh, time dependent uh, 3D stochastic group differential equation uh, code. And this is uh, purely written in Fortran um, as uh, it allows us to, 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 well, it's the most uh, known language and the most computational language and it's, it, it gives us uh, quite uh, uh, a lot of speed. Um, the, so what we are solving is a Fokker Planck type equation. And uh, what we are solving is we, are, we solve over uh, N independent uh, Wiener processes that we start at uh, some starting position uh, normally for most of the calculations that we are doing, we are starting at, uh, at Earth, uh, just uh, uh, one AU, just in space. And then we integrate along the path of a particular particle um, up to its uh, exit position. And for most of our cal calculations is we trace up to the outer limits of our solar system at about uh, 85 to 100 AU whereby an AU is the distance between the, uh, the average distance between the sun and earth. So when we solve these, um, then what we do is uh, we just uh, add back, uh, the, we convolute the results of all these uh, independent processes to get our final uh, solution. Now, because we solve uh, over independent uh, processes, uh, our code lends itself very well to being uh, parallelized via MPI, and we don't even actually need to use any complicated routines, just uh, the simple routines uh, uh, work uh, very well for our code. And since as well that uh, we, we wrote this code custom, um, this allows us to be able to control the efficiency of the code as well. So uh, we are able to, depending on exactly the problem set that we are working on, we can change how the load distribution amongst the core is and uh, the cores are handled. We can either go for the uh, uh, load distributed, equally distributed, 
where each core uh, gets a chunk of the same amount of data to, to work with, uh, same in this case, the same amount of uh, pseudoparticles, or uh, we can go a more dynamic way where we say um, each core then gets one particle or one pseudoparticle to start with, uh, does the processing, and once it's done with the pseudoparticle, it can come get more. And depending on exactly the problem set that you are working on, uh, one does tend to be better than the other. Okay, so if we just take a quick example of uh, um, the work that we did and just showing some uh, scaling um, uh, on uh, a small subset of uh, just 24 cores and working with uh, going from about 100 uh, independent uh, processes to 10,000, we see that from uh, these graphs that our code scales up quite linearly which is exactly what you expect uh, from an MPI process if you are working with uh, an independent processes. And um, this tells us that uh, our code is quite well. And uh, just uh, for indication for any of uh, the work that we did that for us to be able to get a reliable scientific output out of um, our code, we, we can never use anything less than uh, 10,000 independent processes. Uh, to make sure that we always have a reliable scientific output. Okay, uh, if we look at the efficiency, like I've alluded to again, and again, the, the different colors represent the 100 to uh, 10,000 uh, independent processes. Um, you see that the more processes that you use, uh, the higher the efficiency of our code, and that is also to be expected. And for as I alluded to earlier, when we play around, uh, depending on the problem sets that we are trying to solve, when we play around with the load distributions, we are actually trying to make sure that our efficiency never falls uh, below 85%. Uh, this just makes sure that we are using the CHPC resources uh, responsibly. All right, so let's have a look at the modulation code that we are using. So we use uh, the Parker transport equation from 1958, uh, where the first term on the right-hand side uh, represents the outward uh, convection of cosmic rays by the solar wind, and it represents cosmic ray drift as well. Uh, the last term uh, describes adiabatic energy changes, and uh, the term in the middle uh, describes uh, diffusion. Uh, so, like I've already said before, our code is a fully time dependent uh, three dimensional model uh, that uses uh, one AU observational values as inputs uh, normalized. So, uh, we take uh, all measurements at one AU and we normalize them uh, such that they agree with uh, other models or with spacecraft observations as you travel outward in the heliosphere or out, outward in the solar system. So uh, our, tilt, our model takes as input the heliospheric tilt angle as input, uh, the solar wind speed, uh, the heliospheric magnetic field magnitude, the turbulence quantities, uh, including the variances and correlation scales, and it takes as well uh, diffusion and drift coefficients. So uh, if you just look at uh, this figure here, this just shows an example of uh, how um, uh, these uh, observational values at one AU look like. So you have in blue there, we have the hemispheric tilt angle, which is basically the tilt angle that the, the angle at which the sun's magnetic field and equator are at, uh, are off by. And then the orange line there is the sun's uh, magnetic field. And as I've already alluded to earlier on, you can see that it's got an 11 year cycle. Uh, both of them actually do have an 11 year cycle. And it goes from being uh, quite active. Uh, if you look at the magnetic field being around 11 nanotesla to being around uh, 3.5 nanotesla 
and it repeats itself uh, just about every 11 year and it is um, quite uh, dependable to do so. There are of course as well uh, longer time scales that I'm not showing here where uh, it is believed that the, the sun uh, and uh, will have uh, almost a 100 year cycle as well for 110 year cycle, uh, but that's for looking at even longer term uh, variations. Uh, and the, the, the sun's magnetic field, it also has a 22 year cycle where uh, if you think, uh, so every time it goes to 11, then there is a polarity switch over us uh, from the north of the sun to the south. So there is uh, that type of uh, uh, magnetic polarity dependence as well, which you will see when I show data a bit later on. All right, so for our parallel diffusion, uh, we use the quasi-linear theory uh, based on the work done by Tierfel and Schlickheiser in 2003. And it takes uh, this form. I'm not going to explain it in detail. Uh, what I will just note is that uh, it takes as input uh, the heliospheric ma magnetic field as input, and it takes as well the slab uh, turbulence as input. Uh, for the perpendicular diffusion, uh, we use the nonlinear guiding center theory of uh, Matthews and Shalshi. Um, and it is again of uh, this form, which I'm also not going to uh, explain. Uh, but again, I note that it takes the um, heliospheric magnetic field magnitude and this time the 2D turbulence as input but that it is also dependent on the parallel diffusion. So what you end up dealing with is a, a set of solutions that are strictly nonlinear in nature. So it becomes a bit of a, a headache to solve at certain points. Okay, we use the uh, drift coefficient uh, constructed by Engelbrecht et al. 2017, um, which is of uh, this form. And again, uh, it takes the heliospheric magnetic field as input and it takes the total uh, turbulence uh, as input. And it is also quite dependent on a particle's uh, gyro radius. And for cut a neutral sheet drift, we use uh, that developed by uh, Berger 2012. Okay, so uh, this figure just shows uh, some uh, observational values for uh, variances on the left hand side, and it shows the uh, correlation scales on the right hand side. And um, these uh, measurements were done by Voyager 1 and 2 for the variances uh, and the correlation scales in, in 1996. And um, the lines here represent the 2D and the slab variances that I alluded to in the earlier equations. And um, how we get them is we use the model of Zank et al. Uh, 2018 uh, to model them. So the 1AU values are based on observational values that we read in, but uh, how they are then progressed throughout the heliosphere we use that model of Zenk et al. 2018. And they are all constructed to agree um, with data as you move throughout the heliosphere or the solar cycle, uh, the solar system. So let's have a look at uh, some uh, model outputs. So if you look at uh, the figure that I'm showing now, uh, the black uh, solid line uh, that goes from about uh, 1997 to about uh, the end of where my graph is showing uh, around 2014 is the ACE spacecraft uh, measurements of uh, protons. The dashed lines going from about uh, 1977 all the way to about 2003 or so show the IMP-8 uh, spacecraft measurements and the solid gray line represents uh, our model uh, outputs. Uh, all of these are for protons at uh, 1.28 uh, GB. 
And uh, if you check, you will see that our model follows the data trend fairly well. Um, although uh, at certain periods, uh, if you look at periods between uh, 1980 to 1983, uh, 1990 to 1992, and 2000 to about 2003, 2004, our model tends to be overshooting uh, the data. Now, one of the reasons for this is that we are not currently fully including the physics that is, is happening during uh, the, uh, the solar maximum period, as I've already uh, indicated, where the sun tends to be quite active and uh, throwing a lot of material into space. So uh, this is something that our model still needs to be worked on. But if you look at uh, the periods of around 1997, uh, 1987, and 2009, you will see that our model reproduces the data quite well. And um, this uh, makes us uh, believe, or this has shown us that we are able to model these quite well. And um, the colored lines that are here uh, also represent uh, time periods over which uh, a different range of energies, not just 1.2 GV, uh, was uh, measured, and we'll be able to, we, we can then fit our models to a larger range of data. And this I will be discussing in the next slide, which we see here. And I, again, as I've already alluded to, if you look at the orange and red lines, uh, they represent uh, those uh, times of uh, higher solar activity I was talking about, where our model uh, overshoots the data. And this tells us that we do in fact need to implement more physics in our model. And then uh, if we check the uh, green, uh, blue and purple lines, uh, they are during the solar minimum conditions as, uh, and we can very clearly see that we are able to fit the data on a much larger range of uh, energy dependence. Uh, the black uh, line there represents uh, data taken over a number of different years. And uh, I think it's actually between 2006 and 2008. And we are also able to fit that data if we start looking at data averages. Okay. So some typical run times for this type of processing uh, on the CHPC is uh, we normally use the full uh, 48 hour window that we are given for, for the wall time. Uh, we, uh, for most of these runs, uh, use about 1,200, which is about, I think it's about 50 cores, uh, 50 nodes rather, sorry, that we use. Um, our model is not so memory in intensive so over the about the 48 hours and across all the nodes, we only use about 340 gigabytes. And as I've already mentioned, when we started off, um, we try to keep uh, the efficiency of our code at about 85%. And if we start dipping anywhere below that, then we try to go into the code and make sure that we are running as efficiently as possible. So, uh, what this model has done is given us and, and allowed us to gain a better understanding of the primary drivers of cosmic ray modulation and the fundament, uh, fundamental physics that are involved in the transportation of these uh, highly charged particles originating uh, from uh, supernovae. Uh, this physics first model uh, is moving us into a position where we'll be able to do uh, predictive uh, uh, modeling, uh, meaning that uh, at some point in the future, we hope within the next uh, three or to five years, uh, we will be able to model and be able to tell uh, anybody who wants to go into space uh, how uh, and how much danger there would be uh, for them going there. And this would not be possible without the CHPC. Um, it would be very difficult and uh, we are really indebted to the CHPC for allowing us to, and giving us the resources to do this work. And we aim to adapt and grow the model and code 
uh, as the CHPC evolves, uh, the CSPC will be getting new hardware. And as the GPU systems on the CHPC uh, grow, we hope to get more students that will be able to migrate our code to the GPU system and be able to use it effectively there. Okay, and uh, these are just some of the papers that were published uh, in the past three years uh, from the work that has been done on the CHPC. And I thank you for your attention. Great, thank you, Mr. Moloto. And I would say the future, Dr. Moloto. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any time uh, for any questions, but I'd like to thank you for the very interesting and relevant uh, talk that you've uh, given. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, uh, we can move on to our next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Baha. He's from Stellenbosch uh, University. Um, so he'll be presenting on sophisticated classification of coughing sounds with a diagnosis of TB and COVID-19 patients. Uh, this achieved from application of machine learning algorithms, which requires extreme HPC computational resources. Uh, Dr. Baha, over to you. Hello there. Hi. Madhu, um, I'm going to present our work. Hello, everybody. This is Madhu. Um, I'm going to present our work titled Lung Health Screening by Automatic Cough Analysis with Applications to Tuberculosis and the Recent Pandemic COVID-19. Thomas is my supervisor and we work in the Digital Signal Processing Lab at Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering in Stellenbosch University. Lung disease is such a disease which affects our breathing system and when our breathing system gets something in it, um, one of the first thing we do is that we cough. And thus one of the obvious symptoms of lung disease is cough. In this work, we have presented machine learning algorithms for automatic analysis of coughing sounds uh, to screen for tuberculosis. We have also developed a classifier able to automatically discriminate between coughs by COVID-19 positive and healthy subjects and between coughs by COVID-19 positive and COVID-19 negative subjects. Why are we interested in such a work? Well, there are many benefits in screening by analyzing cough. Um, one of them is that it is non-invasive, which means that no contact is necessary for such a screening system to work. Another benefit is that it can be administered by staff who have very little knowledge about special equipment. And finally, the screening system can be implemented in the smartphone by means of an app or website, thus making it very cost effective as most of us use a smartphone. Such systems can also be easily deployed and no need to have any contact with other patients, which will help in stop spreading a virus. TB or tuberculosis is mostly common in low income households and it causes 95% deaths in developing countries like South Africa. Diagnostic tests require modern special equipment, which requires trained staff, thus making it costly for poorer population in the society. TB is a type of lung disease which affects our breathing system and it works differently under different lung disease. That's why different lung disease produce coughs which have different features uh, distinguishable by machine learning algorithms. We have already dis differentiated coughs from TB patients and healthy subjects with high accuracies in our previous studies. And in this study, we show that it is also possible to discriminate between coughs from TB patients and coughs from sick patients with other um, lung conditions. This is how we have collected our data in an outside cross ventilated sputum collection booth at a primary health care clinic near uh, Cape Town. Um, two nurses were trained to handle the recording equipment. As we have seen in the previous slide, the recording area didn't have any noise protection system and thus had a lot of environmental noise in our recordings, such as 
um, say dog barking, uh, people chatting in the background, um, car engines and running, uh, etc. Thus, it perfectly represents um, a real world a TB screening test scenario in a developing country uh, like in South Africa. So our data set contains cough recordings from sick patients with TB and um, non-TB. Um, as we can see in the table, um, there are 16 TB patients and 33 uh, non-TB patients, a so total of 49 patients and we have 402 coughs from TB and 956 uh, non-TB coughs. So as we can see, the data set uh, is skewed towards non-TB cases, which means that this is largely imbalanced and um, we have very few TB coughs in our data set at the moment. But these are the feature extraction hyperparameters. Um, as we can see, the, the frame length as the size of the frames in samples in which the audio is segmented. Um, that has a range from 2 to the power 8 to 2 to the power 12, which means um, 256 to 4096. And if we say it in times, that means 5 milliseconds to 100 um, milliseconds. A number of segments, the number of segments in which the group frames were grouped, um, that varies from one to four. Um, did we take average over the, the segments? Um, well, it's a binary answer, yes or no. Um, the number of uh, linear lip spaced uh, log filter banks, well, that has been varied from 40 to 200 in steps of 20. And finally, the MFCCs, the number of lower order MFCC coefficients to keep um, that has uh, three different values, 13, 26 and 39. And the features we have extracted, they are the MFCC along with the velocity and the accelerations, uh, linearly spaced filter banks, um, zero crossing rates and spectral kurtosis. We have used um, a nested K4 cross validation as our data set is small and largely imbalanced. Um, our full data set is split as 20% of test set and 80% development set. The development set is used to optimize the hyperparameters inside the NL loop A while splitting the data set 20% for testing and 75% for training. Um, at the same time, the NLOB was also used for measuring a threshold equal error rate. And finally, the optimized, hyper, hi, optimized hyperparameters were used uh, to evaluate the classifier performance on the test set. And this work is continued for uh, five folds. Now, obviously, this work is computationally uh, very expensive as we had a wide range of hyperparameters for both uh, feature extraction and the classifiers. So we use the CHPC clusters all the time to train and evaluate the classifiers and we got the results uh, fairly uh, quickly. These are the five classifiers which we have trained and evaluated. So the first one is a logistic regression, LR. Um, we use this classifier as the uh, baseline. Uh, the other one is the support vector machine, the SVM, uh, K-nearest neighborhood, KNN, uh, multilayer perceptron, MLP, and finally the convolutional neural network, uh, CNN. So these are the hyperparameters, the classifier, classifier hyperparameters, which were trained um, in the inner loop of the nested K4 cross validation uh, for LR and SVM. We had the regularization strength, which is very the, from 10 to the power minus seven to 10 to the power seven. There are the penalty ratios L1 and L2 uh, for LR, which is also uh, been optimized, the number of hidden layers in the multilayer perceptron model, the L2 penalty estimator, the stochastic gradient descent, um, kernel coefficients, number of neighbors, lift size for the KNN, uh, and for the convolutional neural network, the number of convolutional layers, the dropout rate, and the batch size. So we have um, 
um, a fairly large set of um, hyperparameters which were optimized inside the, the inner loop of the nested K4 cross validation. So the area under the curve AUC has been used to assess the classifier performance. Um, this is particularly because that our data set is largely imbalanced and AUC is not affected by the class imbalance uh, present in the data set. And as we can see, the, the ALR classifier had the highest mean AUC, which is 0 0.8632. Um, MLP had the highest one 0 0.80, uh, SBM had 0 0.74, KNN 0 0.77 and CNN uh, 0 0.71. And as we can see that the logistic regression, the LR classifier, it has performed the best uh, while uh, it extracted 26 MFCC features. And it's also the question, why did the other classifiers didn't perform very well? Um, well, the, the answer is that we didn't have a large data set. Um, LR classifier is basically a single neuron and it's, it's easier to train and evaluate. And for the CNN and the other deep neural networks, they require um, large data set, which we don't have at the moment. But then we have applied the sequential forward search on the best performed feature data set with total uh, 78 features. Um, this SFS is um, a kind of greedy search method. Um, we have also got the velocity and the acceleration coefficients of 26 MFCC, uh, which results in um, in a, a 78 dimensional feature vector. And while we have done the forward search, we have found out that for the best 23 feature combinations, we have achieved the highest AUC of 0 0.94. This is the mean ROC curve for the best 23 combinations of the the best performing feature um, showing the, the AUC of 0 0.9421, which is the highest we found for an ALR classifier. So finally, we can say that we have successfully discriminated TB coughs from non-TB coughs by using a logistic regression ALR classifier with the uh, area under the curve, uh, the highest value of 0 0.94. Next, it's our COVID-19 cough classification work. Um, as an introduction, we can say um, COVID-19 is announced as a global pandemic on 11th of February 2020 um, by World Health Organization, WHO. Um, since then, 55.7 million people have been infected with COVID-19 virus and 1.3 million have died globally. Uh, COVID-19 is caused by the severe acute respiratory syndrome virus and this virus affects our respiratory system. Um, this is why one of the most common symptoms of COVID-19 is dry cough. So basically we have applied the same TB detection methodology to classify the COVID-19 coughs. Smartphones have been used to collect patients' data, such as symptoms including audio recordings of coughs. Um, we have developed our own data set and named it as um, SARCOS. However, we haven't got a huge positive response from the patient, so at the moment the SARCOS data set is small. So we have used another publicly available COSVARA data set for COVID-19 classification work. Now the COSVARA data set, it contains subjects from Asia, Europe, Australia, North and South America. Our SARCOS data set contains subjects mainly from Africa and most of them are from South Africa. We have extracted features from both data sets and the COVID-19 classifier is trained and evaluated on COSVARA data set and the highest AUC of 0 0.98 has been achieved by using a residual base um, ResNet 50 architecture. 
We couldn't train the classifiers on Sarkos data set as it is very small, but we have evaluated the best performed classifiers on Sarkos data set and achieved AUC of 0 0.94 from a long short term memory, the LSTM classifier from 13 best feature combinations after running the greedy search SFS. Now this is what we got uh, in our Coswara data set. We have 1079 healthy subjects and 92 COVID positive subjects. Um, most of the participants, um, they are 20 to 50 years old. Um, there are more male subjects than female subjects. And finally, most of the participants, they are from Asia. Uh, but there are subjects from Australia, Europe, North and South America as well. Uh, among Asia, the most of the subjects are from India. Now this is how the Sarkos data set looks like at the moment. Um, we have 13 COVID negative and 8 COVID positive subjects in the data set. And unlike Coswara data set, there are more female subjects than male subjects. All the subjects in this data set are sick and those who have undergone a COVID test were asked to participate. Um, most of them had their test done within past couple of weeks. Uh, some of them did come into contact with other COVID positive patients. Uh, some were coughing for some time and in the Sarkos data set, we have 12 subjects with forced coughs and nine subjects with normal coughs. So finally, as we can see that most of the participants are from Africa and most of them are actually from South Africa. As we have seen that COVID positive subjects are underrepresented in both of those data sets. So we have used the um, synthetic minority oversampling technique or the SMOTE to balance the data set. Now in this method, um, a COVID positive cough is randomly selected and five other existing coughs are chosen. The one with the smallest Euclidean distance is selected and a new cough is created by following the, the equation one. So in this way, we made sure that we didn't just randomly oversample the data set, rather the new data points were created. We have also implemented some extensions to the SMOTE techniques such as the borderline SMOTE, and adaptive synthetic sampling. However, the best result has been achieved with the SMOTE without any extension. We have used um, seven classifiers in this COVID-19 cough classification work. Um, these classifiers uh, had the hyperparameters and they were optimized by using uh, leave P out cross validation, which is shown next. Um, the seven classifiers are the LR classifier, the logistic regression, which is again used as the baseline to improve the other classifiers. Um, we have used the support vector machine, K nearest neighbor, a multilayer perceptron, and as the deep neural network, we have used the CNN, the convolution neural network, uh, long short term memory, LSTM, and finally, uh, residual based architecture, um, ResNet 50. Now this is the leave P out cross validation. So we have the full data set of N patients and then we split the data set with J patient as a test set and N minus J patient as the development set. And inside we optimize the hyperparameters and then use the optimum hyperparameters to evaluate uh, the classifier on the test set. And then we carry on um, following the same procedure until all the patients have been used at least once. So these are the results um, from the classifiers which are trained and evaluated on the Coswara data set. Um, the LR classifier gave us the highest AUC 0 0.7362 and just by looking at the data set we can see the potential of using the other classifiers and then we applied the SVM which had the increase the, the AUC uh, to 0 0.81 and then we used the MLP which 
even further increase the the AUC to 0 0.89. And then uh, finally, the deep neural network, they perform really good. Um, the CNN had the highest AUC of 0 0.95. ALSTM had 0 0.94. But uh, the best performance we have achieved from the, the residual architecture, uh, ResNet 50, and the AUC we had is almost 0 0.98 or 0 0.9759. Then we have used the same classifiers, uh, which are trained on the Coswara dataset, and then we evaluated on the Sarkos dataset. Um, this is good to keep in mind the Coswara dataset is much larger and our Sarcos dataset is very small. So we can't train our classifiers on the Sarcos dataset. So what we have done with the classifiers trained on the, on the, the Coswara dataset has been evaluated on the Sarcos dataset. And while we, while we have done that, um, we, we got the AUC, the highest AUC we have um, we have achieved from an LSTM, which is 0 0.7786. And then we have applied the same procedure, the sequential forward search, the same greedy search method we, we used for the, the TB classification work. And we have achieved the highest AUC of 0 0.94 uh, from the 13 best combination of the, the features. and. As we can see, the number is is 42. And that's because we had the 13 um, MFCC along with velocity and the acceler accelerations. And also we had the linearly spaced log filter banks, um, kurtosis and, and the zero crossing rates. So in conclusion, we can say that we have successfully developed TB and COVID-19 cough classification systems for testing and deployment is in progress. Um, and also we want to th say a big thank you to the CHPC because they have allowed us to use their Langu cluster. And because of that, we can tune and optimize all the hyperparameters for the, the classifiers and for the feature extraction process within a few months. Um, without the CHPC, we couldn't have done it with a, within a few months. And we used it continuously and used multiple cores. And that's how we reduce the processing time required for these hyperparameter optimization process for the neural network. And we also uh, been able to extract features by using a wide range of parameter values. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. That was a very interesting talk. Uh, we'll look, move on to the Q and A uh, session, and uh, we have two questions there. Um, you can read them out, or should I read it out for you? No, it's fine. Um, I can just read. It's from Kazim. I uh, says these classifiers models which determine its performance, which makes sense when comparing the same model in different settings. Which, what is your basis for comparing uh, different models? Um, okay, so for the first um, question. Well, when we have different models, we can see which one is performing um, better than the others. And also it's the reason why. Um, as we can see for the TB classification work, we didn't have um, a big data set. We had a small data set. And for the small data set, um, we can train the, the logistic regression um, classifier because it basically it's a single neuron is used. Uh, that's the, the activation layer for the CNN or the LSTM when they're connecting blocks. So um, that's why you use different models and also uh, to train an LR classifier is much easier. So when we have a bigger data set, it's always uh, good to run an LR classifier because if we get something out of LR classifier, say um, AUC of 0 0.7, then it's worth running um, other classifiers because if, if, if we get LR classifier 50-50, 
then we have to think, well, is there any point running other uh, classifiers or not? Because that's something we had to think at the beginning, because uh, obviously we had uh, reasons to find out that um, the coughs can be classified from TB patients and the healthy patients, but we didn't know that would we uh, find any evidence of uh, classifying coughs from TB and the other uh, sick patients. So that's why we, we use different models. Um, I think that's answered the first one. The second one is, um, okay, thank you very high relevant machine learning. And then there can be noise of a problem with recording this ordinary. In cases where the train models fail predicted positive and negative, so was there any correlation with low noisy? Uh, or, or how noisy the recording was? Yeah, I think that's a good question, but um, obviously we didn't have a very big data set. I think I think the question from Quinn uh, Reynolds is, is asking about the TB uh, patients because the, the the COVID ones. They, I mean, I just used a pre pre processing uh, for the the data set uh, for the TB one. We didn't have that many coughs, so we did annotate. And yes, we had the background noise and um, obviously the coughs were annotated. So to answer really, to, to answer your question, uh, I don't know because I don't know the signal to noise ratio. It's just like taking in a real world environment. And that's why we need more data. Um, yes, there were um, background noises, um, but as we can see, the classifier has performed really good. Uh, so, the noise didn't affect the classifier performance um, for the TB classification. Okay, so, and the third one is from, um, okay, sorry, uh, um, Afra, the thing about have you measured the robustness of the model by using the trained data set plus the new data set? How much computational resources was, were used or time? Um, the robustness of the model we're using the trained data set and the new data set. Yes, we did. I mean, I think what you meant by your question is that um, did we consider the both data sets for the classifiers? Yes, we did. I mean, for the COVID one, obviously we had the Coswara data set. That's a publicly available one. And the other one we got is an our, um, the SARCOS data set is in, in, in South Africa. Um, both data set, they're getting larger. And obviously the data set we got is not too small, but it's fairly um, large size and the, the results are there. Um, but also when we get more data, I think that would be even better. So, I mean, basically if a classifier performs say 0 0.95 AUC on 1000 patients and another classifier performs say 0 0.95 on 10,000 or 20,000 patients, I think the latter one is more convincing. So, and that's where we are trying to get to, uh, but to get the, obviously we need more data. So that's what we are, um, we are waiting at the moment and we are processing the data and getting more data. And the second one is how much computational resources? Well, um, I think it's for me, um, we had, I used 20 uh, CPU cores in the, the CHPC. And um, I think it's my, the CPU user hours went over 70,000. So this is how um, I use, I mean, mo CHPC, most of my work, the classification, the hyperparameter tuning and the sequential forward search, uh, CHPC did it in days where my PC would do take about a week. So, yeah. Okay, um, I think uh, Kasim came back to me. The question is on how do you compare just regression SVM? Which SVM will it be as you have the multiple SVM, some not performing a lot and some Hmm. When, how, and why do you decide the SVM model was better? And what about comparing on Apple? <laughs> um, yeah, basically, okay. So what I put in my slides is the best two um, um, AUC. The, the, the way we evaluated one classifier is performing better than the others is by using the area under the curve. Um, there are specificity, sensitivity, accuracy, but we went for the AUC because um, there is a large imbalance uh, present in the data set. Um, what happened that when we used an LR classifier, we'd find out the, the best performing um, 
the hyperparameters which would give the highest AUC for an ALR classifier or say for the SVM, what we had, we tuned the other hyperparameters for SVM to get the, 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 the best AUC. Um, what, what we have found in the COVID-19 um, classifier, the SVM always outperformed the ALR one. So um, it hasn't been the case where ALR has been better than the SVM. So uh, what I'm trying to say that the deep neural networks, uh, so like CNN, LSTM, ResNet 50, they always perform better than, um, than, than ALR or say the KNN or SVM. Um, I think that's, does that answer your question? I think. Thank you, Dr. Bauer. I think those are all the questions uh, we have and I would like to thank you so much for your presentation. You're welcome, thanks. Thank you, I think this uh, ends the session uh, for today. Thank you very much everybody.